Welcome to Chats with the Chief. I'm John Jensen, Chief of Staff at the Veterans Health Administration, and this is the podcast where we make small talk about the largest integrated health care system in the country. This week, I'm joined by Mr. Chris Sandals, Director of the South Texas VA Healthcare System. We get to talk about managing the fastest growing VA health care system in the country and standing up VHA's Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Enjoy the show. Well, thanks again for, uh, for coming on and doing this and uh, sharing your story and uh, I'm, I'm sure everybody's going to be uh, as enthralled with it as I have been when I first met you and just really appreciate all the great work that you've done. So maybe to kick things off, why don't we maybe describe you know, a little bit about yourself so everybody can get to know you. Sure. Uh, so uh, Chris Andles, I'm the Medical Center Director at the South Texas uh, Veterans Healthcare System. Uh, you know, time has flown by. I can't believe I, this month is two years uh, that I've been in, in South Texas. And, I came to South Texas from Central Texas, which was my first directorship. I was there for uh, just over two years. Um, yeah, I've been with VA 16 years, uh, six or seven you know, different VA healthcare systems, and I've just really had a great ride. That's great. Yeah. So uh, reading your bio, are you still in the Navy? Navy Reserves, yes. Yeah. Uh, so what do you do there? Uh, uh, Medical Service Corps, right? So it's an easy way to do the same job and uh, get paid <laughs> for it twice. Um, but, uh, you know, my Navy Reserve career really has been nothing significant. I actually started in the Navy when I was the associate director at the Michael E. DeBakey oh, uh, wow. VA Medical Center in Houston. And Again, every, everything with me is a long story, <laughs> but uh, you know, I am, um, so when I, uh, gosh, so I was playing college football at a small private school in Missouri and uh, transferred, decided, you know, at that point I was 20, it had several surgeries related to football, transferred to Texas Tech and uh, decided to join Air Force ROTC. And uh, the shortest version of the story would be, um, you know, if there's one thing I've learned about myself is I'm, especially in my younger, younger years, I wasn't the best at taking orders and was really good at giving them sometimes and just got nervous and said, hey, I don't know if my personality is going to work for the military. And uh, went through all the quals, you know, was in my first semester of class and just got cold feet and said, you know, I just, I just don't know about this. And, um, you know, finished college, finished my MBA, and lo and behold, found myself working at the VA, uh, which was a um, personal connection for me. Both my parents are, are veterans, uh, father Air Force, mother Army, my father's father, uh, my grandfather is a Korean War veteran Army. And um, just thought, you know, I've had a great career with the VA. I've got two parents that are in the military. I've had my military exposure through them, uh, but I've still never put on the uniform. Mm -hmm and um, started looking up age restrictions because I was getting up there. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know, went through my direct commission uh, as the associate director in Houston. But it was really interesting, John, because in VA, uh, I'm, I'm kind of right on the line now, but still considered relatively young uh, amongst uh, executives in the VA. And how strange it was uh, to go through that direct commission right. in the Navy and be one of the old guys. Old, yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, having people call you grandpa. And I thought, this is very, very interesting. Yeah. But uh, really, really eye opener for me. What a what a well rounded yeah. part of the career, though, to be able to have that perspective of the the, the young guy, yeah. at the executive level, at the and the VA at the same time as being the old guy yeah. in the in in the uh, younger profession, I Absolutely. would say, of the of uh, the military. Uh, one of the things we like to always do on this show or podcast, we still really don't know what we call this, but <laughs> the chance for the employees to get to know sure. leadership is to uh, maybe describe some things that your uh, book, movie, TV show, something that uh, you're mm -hmm. either involved with reading or watching that uh, would be interesting with sharing with everybody else. Sure, so um, actually probably a, a couple couple things. So I'll, I'll mention a couple books because my uh, attention spans with books is like many other things. I'm usually reading two to three at a, yeah. at a time. Uh, I'm also really big on, on audio books, right? I've had a lot of long commutes. So um, a couple audio books that uh, I'm listening to right now uh, one is uh, service fanatics, right? So um, obviously uh, VHA is on a high reliability journey and we define that as zero harm and an unmatched experience. Right? So we, we have a book club at the South Texas Veterans oh, Healthcare System that's focused on high reliability. And the first book we read was Zero Harm, great book, a good foundational book. Uh, but the next book that we're reading is called Service Fanatics, which is from the first chief experience officer at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, and it's just really interesting. It talks about their journey, not necessarily to high reliability, but their journey to making the patient the center of everything that they do. And 
Uh, so he talks a lot about his role as the chief experience officer working with Toby Cosgrove and getting you know that entire healthcare system wow. uh, moving in that direction. So we thought it fit well, not just with VHA's focus on high reliability, but uh, as we've uh, messaged high reliability in our healthcare system and hired our first chief experience officer, oh, wow. the timing just made sense. Uh, so that's, that's a really good book. Uh, the other one that I've been waiting for, it's okay so far, admittedly, uh, is uh, Obama's book that he wrote after his presidency called A Promised Land. So I'm only in the second chapter. I don't want to draw any conclusions, mm -hmm. but my blood's not pumping uh -huh. yet. Uh, so I'm, I'm waiting to get to the meat of it. He sh he, I just got done reading, uh, listening to the chapter uh, about his uh, decision to run for Senate, which was pretty interesting. Uh, but you know, we'll, uh, it's, it's a well, long read, and it looks like I've got 29 hours left to go. <laughs> so I won't draw any conclusions on that one yet. Uh, so you mentioned movies, so this will be sort of odd, but I, I will, I will, I'll admit it. I got two young kids, uh, eight and nine, uh, and so if there's one thing I really enjoy watching with them are Disney movies. Right. Um, it, honestly, I think as adults, as kids, many of us I think missed some of those, missed the direct messaging of yep. some of those really foundational messages. About caring about other people. About caring yeah. about other people, right? Working yep. for what you want, and you know, in some cases, everyone's going to be the underdog, and yep. um, valuing what's important. Uh, and so I really enjoy watching Disney movies with the kids because that messaging is much more direct. Yeah. Uh, and it's almost an opportunity to you know, revisit you know, some of the decisions that you've made in your life, make sure you're focusing on the right things. And, uh, the one that uh, we just watched was, I think, Soul is the name of it. Oh my gosh, I love that. It's a it really so good, good movie. I, I was really surprised. I watched it by with that. my wife. <laughs> it was so It was good. really good. It was so so uh, good. that one, The Lorax, I mean, just a number of yeah. uh, just really good kids' movies. Um, I'm not really into shows, so yeah, nothing there. Me either. And um, like you, I'm I have five books next mm. to me on the nightstand. Wow. <laughs> and I'm I'm you know halfway with through most of them. One of them I just started another mm. one. And five books. And it, it's not it's it shouldn't be impressive. <laughs> I kind of like get to a point where I'm like okay. I'm kind of good good at this point, mm -hmm. and then another interest comes along, and I'll and I'll chase it. So okay. I'll get them all done yeah. by the end of the year. Um, but I don't know why I do that. But I I like to read as well. As a matter of fact, I was down in Houston last fall mm -hmm. and uh, needed a book for the flight home, mm -hmm. and I picked up a book and and read it. So that's kind of how I yeah. just started new books. I didn't have one with me. So, but Soul was a great movie. Yeah. No, I finish at least half of them. <laughs> <laughs> finish at least half of them. <laughs> um, so how about what is something interesting or unique about you that people may not know, your, your team may not even know? Um, oh, oof, gosh, that's a, that's a loaded one. Um, so um, I'm an uh, incessant tinkerer, right? Um, so um, my, my dad, the uh, Air Force veteran, when he got out of service, he started a, a mechanic shop. So um, he's owned a shop in Dallas, you know, fixing cars for years. And so I think I got some of that tinkering from, uh, from him, but I'm always, as my wife would say, breaking something. <laughs> uh, but no, probably one of my most interesting projects I worked on during the COVID pandemic, and uh, it was a, um, I got really into uh, solar energy um, and uh, ended up finding a, a gentleman in San Antonio that was, his family owned some property, they had some solar panels there and you know, were selling the property but kept the solar panels. And so the shortest version of the story is I ended up building a pretty unique, uh, I call it a solar system, right? So uh, I've got a, a solar generator that I built for the house wow. uh, where, you know, if we have a power outage, it's not on a transfer switch, uh, but it is on an inverter. So I can power most things in the house uh, off of, what, uh, what five now, 380 watt uh, solar panels. Uh, 800 amp hour battery bank and an inverter so we can wash clothes we've got wow. electricity I can run the fridge we can watch TV um, with That's this you know, solar thing I, I worked on from about April I may have probably finished it around June, but uh, I think that's a little bit more than tinkering. <laughs> well, you, you know, it's amazing what you can learn from YouTube, right? And so, yeah, yeah, that's true. Actually, it's, it's, it's very amazing. True. And so, I you just watched video after video after video, and my dad, you know, having some knowledge of you know electrical current, was able to walk me through some of the wiring to make sure I didn't blow the place up. Yeah. But it's been really interesting, that's right? Fantastic. And so, um, you know, I can, we can run the fridge and washing machine most days. That's fantastic. Yeah. I'll have to learn how to do stuff like yeah. that. I'll, t I'll send you some pictures. Dude, it's, it's really neat. Yeah, my wife keeps trying to put uh, solar panels on the on the roof, and uh, the HOA is not buying it. But she no. doesn't, she doesn't buy that. So. Ah, so we had the same issue. So I ended up um, we the our house is in a cul-de-sac, and so we end up with these two smaller backyards because of you know it's in the sort of a you know cul-de-sac, 
And uh, so one of the yards faces uh, southwest, and with panels, you really want them facing west. I had to do all this research and find yeah. the angles and the direction. And so um, ended up ground mounting them so that they're not on the roof, right? They're not reflecting into a neighbor's house or right. anything. <laughs> but uh, it's working really, really nicely. Well, that's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, what lesson or a piece of advice have you ever gotten that you just hold on to and it's something you're kind of your go-to thing? Um, I got a couple of these. You may have to do some, some editing on this one. Yes. <laughs> I, I got a couple of these. So I'm really big on, on quotes. And so there's just certain times I'll be talking to someone, they'll tell me a little snippet and I just hold on to it. I hold on to it forever. So some of that came from my, from my, my dad hates it when I call him my old man. but. <laughs> Uh, it came from my old man growing up, and um, you know, one thing that he said that had just stuck with me, has just stuck with me forever, is he said, you know, son, you can work hard now, uh, or you can work hard for the rest of your life. Uh, and I think in, in the context that he was explaining that to me, it was more about, you know, focusing on school, focusing on academics, uh, so that, you know, I didn't have to turn wrenches, you know, like he was turning wrenches as a mechanic. Now, he loves what he does, but he made clear he didn't want me doing that. Yeah. Uh, so we talked a lot about, you know, that focus on uh, academia, I think, in that context. And that, and that really stuck with me. But um, in the way that I tend to, to convolute things, I've kind of applied it to life in general because when does now stop and the rest of your life begin, right? So you ultimately have to continue to work hard no matter what you're doing. Yeah. But it's, in, you know, in essence to prevent, um, you know, future, future challenges. So that's, that's one. Uh, that really stuck with me. The other one was actually from a, a finance professor in graduate school. And I, I will say on the record, I hated this guy. I, I did not like <laughs> That's him. That's one of the best ones. Yeah, <laughs> Professor Ritchie. And um, he, uh, he had this thing where if you showed up late to class, 10 minutes he'd give you to get there. And if you weren't there in 10 minutes, he'd lock the door. Oh, so, wow. you, so you couldn't get in. Now, all the courses were recorded, so you could go back to your dorm or your apartment somewhere and watch it, but you weren't going to interrupt the class. And so one of the, um, I learned that the hard way, by the way. And so uh, one of the, um, the quotes from uh, Professor Ritchie was um, his definition of success. And so he wrote success out as a functional equation. Uh, and so he said success, which is S, you know, is, e is equal to a function of ability and motivation. And uh, he put this in context of the students that he'd seen come through his MBA mm -hmm. finance class, saying that, uh, you know, I've, I've worked with a lot of students that have a lot of natural ability. Um, and you know, they can pass my class with an A+, plus, but they're not motivated uh, to do anything. Uh, and so I've seen you know, some of those same students that were in my MBA class working at the grocery store down the street. Yeah. Uh, so don't fool yourself into thinking that just because you're smart, uh, that's gonna mean you're successful. Uh, so you've gotta be motivated as well. And basically saying that with some combination of those two, ability and motivation, uh, anyone can be successful. Uh, so that one, uh, uh, was, yeah. is another one that, uh, that, that really stuck with me. So I, I can go on forever, but those are two that um, have really worked well for me for quite some time. Well, I think that what you allude to is having so many of those things is that, that, that those are things that you can pull from, exactly. not only for your own motivation or energy, but also help Absolutely. Uh, your staff, employees, and, uh, and uh, others to, to kind of feel the same thing, Absolutely. understand it, help them to, to do a picture of what the future can look like mm -hmm. if you apply those things. So those are, those are both very great. So uh, as the leader of the healthcare system in San Antonio, the South Texas healthcare system, how's the vaccine going? It's going. Yeah. You know, I think um, we all have this, um, there's, a lot, there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of challenges, right? I think the opportunity is having access to a vaccine in and of itself is just um, a breath of fresh air, right? We've been delivering a lot of bad news for the past year number of patients hospitalized, the number of deaths, the number of convalescent cases. It's nice to have positive metrics uh, to begin to report, like the percentage of our veterans and the percentage of our workforce that are vaccinated. So just the opportunity to do that, I think, is yeah. amazing. Uh, the flip side, yeah, but I think very similar to where we, when we started the pandemic, we had some stumbling. And a lot of that had to do early in the pandemic with PPE and supply and supply chain management. Over time, those things moved out. Uh, and I think we'll see, we're gonna go through the same thing with vaccinations. There's limited supply, there's a lot of folks that are interested. Uh, and so the process is a little clunky as I think many of our healthcare systems are overwhelmed with emails, phone calls, secure yeah. messages from every veteran that we provide care to and their caregivers and family members that want them to receive the vaccine now. And I would love to vaccinate everyone today, but the supply is not there. Uh, so it does require, I think, unique messaging, a bit more um, surgical precision with yeah. how we've deployed it. 
So uh, in our healthcare system, we're doing well. We're over 10,000 now veterans vaccinated. We've got about That's 101,000 that we serve. So we're you know, close to 10, just over 10%. Um, and so our issue has not been staffing. Uh, it has not been space at this point. It's strictly supply. Supply vaccine. Uh, so we've had to slow yeah. up just a little bit to be certain we didn't get over our, our feet in terms of second doses. But uh, we had a Saturday event just this last weekend, went out without a hitch, vaccinated over 1,000 veterans uh, on Saturday, most of those second doses. And then we'll have another first vaccination event uh, this Saturday, February 6th. That's great. And I, I and imagine that, you know, they're still dealing with COVID. Absolutely. And as well, adding on the vaccine. And, um, we, you know, we just had a million doses administered in the department, in VHA. Oh, wow. Um, yesterday. Wow. And uh, so we're doing well. And I think one of the quotes that was in the in, was in the local paper was uh, oh actually it was in military.com uh, we have administered more vaccine than 42 states wow. have administered so that says a lot about great. with what you're doing and other medical center directors and those on the ground that are um, getting shots in arms I yeah. mean, there's a lot of work being done there is and you mentioned it about the vaccine I and mean, that's something we're pushing really hard to continue to try to get as much as we can and as fast as we can and I think examples of you know a thousand on a day or 10,000 or 11 percent of your population shows that you know how you have been able to manage it and how your teams are managing yeah the things. teams really have shown some flexibility I think uh, the largest event we've had so far was uh, uh, it was on a Saturday we did 23 2300 vaccinations Wow that's fantastic well I know lots more work to, to go and and you said it at the beginning that uh, you know the, I look at this as the vaccine was the beginning of the end mm -hmm. we're not there yet but at least we can know that there is going to be something coming along in the end of it. So excited about that. Um, you're at the fastest growing healthcare system in our system. Um, how do you manage all the things that has to come <laughs> with that from all the new enrollees coming in and all the many di different things you have going on there? And, and you have an SEI unit there and just so many great things going on in your yeah. facility. But how do you manage all those things? Yeah, well, um, so uh, I'll answer your question first and then give you a bit more context of the healthcare system. So. Um, honestly, I don't manage it. Our team manages it, right? Uh, I think um, I've, I've been blessed with a great team in South Texas. I think uh, what makes our healthcare system unique is multivariant. Uh, what well, first would be uh, you got mass out migration of many other states to Texas, right? I mean, every day they're telling us there's like 10 or 20,000 people that are moving to the state, uh, and they are moving to much metropolitan areas, Houston, Dallas, and Austin. Really, were the primary three that have been seen their you know, populations grow, right. real estate markets explode. And so San Antonio or South Texas is really almost the last urban uh, bastion in the state that hasn't had this massive influx, but we're definitely seeing it now. A lot of construction, a lot of inflow, the real estate going through the roof. Um, but I think what also makes our system unique is um, uh, both our workforce and uh, our um, academic and DOD affiliations, and then the, the yeah. unique population that we serve. So just you know, briefly hit on those. So our workforce, you know, across VA, you've got about 33%, 33%. of our employees that are veterans. Mm -hmm. Well, South Texas is 41% wow. of our employees that are veterans. But that statistic hides a lot about our, our workforce, right? So you know, like I mentioned folks like me as a reservist, I've never been activated. I don't count as a veteran. I got a, a chief nursing officer who's not a veteran, but she's married to a 20-year retired Marine. She's moved with him 17 times, right? right. Uh, so we've got a lot of other folks on our staff that aren't veterans but have a direct connection to military life, military spouses, parents that you know are prior service, et cetera. Um, so add to that. A, a larger percentage of our veteran population that's service connected. Uh, many of them at one point were stationed in San Antonio and so have chosen to, to stay there. So we've got a lot of folks that have roots. Um, and uh, last but definitely not least, it is, it is um, the epicenter for military medicine with the you know, yep. Brook Army Medical Center and, yep. and others there. So I think you've got a lot of things that are just working in our favor right now and that are driving some of that growth. Uh, but then add to it, you know, our, our leadership team, uh, especially on the, the clinical side, is just phenomenal. Uh, you know, a chief of staff that's retired Air Force, deputy chief of staff that's retired Navy, chiefs of medicine, surgery, um, our CHEO, um, behavioral health, all retired service uh, that bring to them a, mm -hmm. bring with them a unique understanding of what it means to wear the uniform. Uh, but then also bring those relationships that they had from DOD yeah. that make some of our recruitment challenges that others face a bit easier uh, because they know folks that are going to be retiring and looking right. for positions. So we, we got a lot of things working for us right now. Yeah, and I think the great thing about that figure of 41% is that, uh, you know, 
in yeah. the military, it's about service to others. Mm -hmm. In healthcare, it's about service to others. So exactly. you're continuing that help, you know, service to others mantra yeah. that you kind of, when you swear into the military, but also when you start at the VA, when you start at the VA in healthcare, you also are, yeah. you know, affirming to serve others. And, yeah. Yeah. So, so that's all the stuff that, that's going really well. I tell you, there, but there are always challenges, right? So growth is a huge opportunity, but it's a challenge, yeah. right? Because you, you have to grow at a pace that's acceptable to your staff, acceptable to patients, acceptable to stakeholders, acceptable to congressionals that yeah. you know, want the clinic in their and area. Space. And space. Yeah. Uh, so we're having to get uh, get creative. I think to some degree COVID was a pressure valve uh, because it forced us in some cases to have more folks work remotely that we maybe weren't even considering before. Uh, and so um, you know, it gave us some time to reevaluate space needs and in some cases repurpose space. I think mental health would be a great example. So they were already leading the charge for us with virtual health mm -hmm. and just really leaned into it, leading our healthcare system to the point that they just, they realized that, you know what, Th several of these programs can go virtual 95% of the time, which is now giving us the opportunity to take existing space, repurpose it, and, and open a surgical subspecialty clinic for you know, no additional cost to us or obviously the taxpayers, but just great opportunities to use this time to come up with, with solutions like that. Yeah. Um, so in so you talk, talked a lot about employees and mm -hmm. your staff and, and how you manage to keep all these things going because of the, the wonderful staff that you have working mm -hmm. for you and COVID. Uh, what have you learned in, in your response to COVID? Um, you know, obviously the employees, uh, their mm -hmm. resilience and they're continuing to, to show up and do the hard work that yeah. needs to be done. Well, anything else? Um, yeah, probably a couple of things, John. You know, I'd say um, it was more than a blessing that we were one of the 18 flagship high reliability facilities, yep. truly, uh, because we were pretty far. We are, you know, I'd say relatively far into that journey and basic understanding of those principles that it allowed us to really put them um, in very diligent use, mm -hmm. uh, especially when we, you know, saw our summer surge and inpatient census of, you know, 80 plus uh, patients and you know, having to literally renovate the entire hospital to turn almost every unit into a COVID unit. So some of those basic concepts of, you know, deference to expertise and, you know, focusing on resilience and uh, absolutely continuous process improvement um, really saved us, um, to, to be I'm completely blunt with you. Uh, and so it, it taught me a lot about, you know, being able to take those principles and not just message them, but apply them. Um, but, um, I think if the the most important lesson for me was just really understanding the value of one, right? Um, meaning one person, right? One employee that decided to speak up about a particular practice that they saw that maybe others didn't see or didn't feel comfortable speaking up about, but because this one person did, you know, we potentially just saved you know hundreds of other lives. Right. So it really just showed the value of every single employee. Uh, when we talk about high reliability because uh, it really takes everybody to be successful. And so because of that, I think uh, we were able to weather the storm. Now we have had, I think, three now employee deaths, uh, but considering the significant number of, uh, of deaths and illnesses in the other healthcare systems yeah. in the San Antonio Medical Center, um, you know, we've done very well. Yeah, and I'm sure each one of those losses is very absolutely hard on you and the entire team. And I'm um, sure, like the rest of us, mourn the loss of all, anyone that's lost yeah. to COVID. Um, employees is, is particularly on our mind. I think it has been. We were um, we were thankful in all cases. The um, you know we had opportunities with our chaplain service to bring yeah. in the bring in the families for virtual um, memorial events and you know talk to their families about how much they meant to our healthcare systems and to their teams and. Um, it, all, it all went really well. You had mentioned uh, quite a lot in, in our discussion so far about kind of, you know, your leadership attributes. You mm -hmm. mean they're, they're, they're flowing out, you mm -hmm. know, that's, you can tell kind of thing. Well, can you talk a little bit about your career trajectory and kind of how, how, you got, how you got to this point in your second directorship? And uh, I know you spent some time out <laughs> at L.A. and been to some, you know, a lot of different systems. So Yeah. Um, the first thing I'll tell you is it was never my plan, right? I was always told if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. And I had <laughs> plans that were just different. And so my, my plan, even coming out of graduate school, was to go to law school. Um, I was supposed to 
you know, I did what was called the 150 program in, at Texas Tech, which combined graduate and undergraduate school. So I did it straight in five instead of, you know, breaking it up and, and, you know, taking six to seven. And so my plan was to go to law school. I said, hey, I'll work a year. I found out about this uh, thing called GHAP uh, mm -hmm. in VA where I can work as an administrative trainee and, you know, have some work experience on my CV uh, when I apply to law school. And then uh, halfway through my administrative fellowship, I got placed in a job as the administrative officer in uh, pathology and laboratory medicine. This was at the North Texas facility in Dallas. And I uh, loved it. I was like, wow, this is really interesting. I mean, I, I like that sort of back office but critical component yeah. of the healthcare systems yeah. that lab plays and just learned a lot about process improvement and obviously contracting because of you know, the number of procurements that we had to work. And just, you know, really liked that job. And uh, said, you know what, I think I'm going to do this for another year or so mm -hmm. uh, before applying to, law, uh, applying to law school. But um, it was during that experience that I had another leadership development uh, moment. Again, I don't know if this is something you guys have to edit out, but I'll, I'll tell you. <laughs> so uh, I, I remember it like it was yesterday, uh, John. So I was uh, the AO in the, in the laboratory at just out of GHAP, and the North Texas facility went through I don't know any other, uh, honestly any other way to say it than that we went through hell. Um, I, I, can re I can remember seeing the front page of the Dallas Morning News and it said Dallas VA worst in the country, big bold print. Mm. And so over the next three to four months, the entire leadership team, uh, senior leadership team, director, associate director, chief of staff, nurse executive, uh, either retired, resigned, or were moved. And I just finished my year-long internship, right, working with that team. And it taught me a lot about um, the difference between, um, I think the easiest way I could say it was knowing the difference between being friends and being friendly. Uh, and, uh -huh. and what I felt like I witnessed was a team that worked so well together that they lost effectiveness, right? That they, they, the, the camaraderie was so strong that they were you know, now no longer able to hold each other accountable. So I made you know, one of my first leadership decisions then is that, hey, I never want to be accused of not being approachable and being friendly. That's, yeah, that is my disposition. But you can't let it go too far right. uh, because once you lose objectivity, you know, you're, you're, yep. you're in trouble. That's right. Um, and so anyway, that team left. A new director came in, and uh, I was in the process of making plans to you know, change careers. And um, anyway, ended up staying at, at North Texas, uh, became the EA to the, to the new director uh, who came in there, uh, Betty Bowen Brown. Never forget Betty. She was mm -hmm. all of this tall. She was a machine gun. Uh, and she you know, just walked really, I had to walk fast. I'm a tall guy, I'm 6'5". <laughs> and I had to walk fast to keep up with Betty because she just went everywhere and wanted to see everything. And so anyway, I worked for Betty for a couple of years. Uh, she retired, uh, a new director came in, Joe Dalpiez. Uh, and so I stayed and worked for Joe for a couple of years as, uh, as his EA, and um, it was just a strange time in VA because we were also getting into, at that point, it was called systems redesign, yep. not yep. necessarily systems engineering or, you know, um, operations management. And, um, w you know, Dallas hadn't decided exactly what it wanted to do, so I ended up being the EA to the director slash systems redesign coordinator. And, uh, again, just really got into process improvement. Um, so the... Went from there to uh, MAS, and uh, again, I can remember a coaching moment. Jeff Milligan, who's now our, our visit yep. director, was our associate director okay. in Dallas at the time. And so I remember Jeff coming into my office as the EA to the director, and he said, hey, you know, Chris, our, our assistant chief of uh, MAS is, is taking a job. At, I think he went to the Philippines. And he said, you should really consider MAS. And I said... You know, Jeff, are you trying to give me good career advice <laughs> right. or are you trying to get rid of me? Yeah, you're trying like, to move me on. <laughs> yeah, like, which, which one is it? But it turned out to just be some of the best career advice ever. And uh, MAS was just across the hall uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the senior leadership suite. And I went over to MAS, and it was at the same time I got into VA's ECF program, Executive Career Field Program. And um, again, just had a, a great developmental opportunity in MAS, got to use some of the systems engineering skills that I'd learned because we had to re just retool a lot of clinic flow. And, um, you know, at that point, my wife and I had been married for about six years, you know, didn't have kids, and uh, really started to consider relocating. And I'd met a number of folks in the ECF program, just a great developmental opportunity, folks all over the country. And that's how I ended up in California. Uh, and so Loma Melinda was, um, it seems like a lot of the West Coast, I never quite understood this, but a lot of the West Coast facilities had abolished uh, medical administration service or health administration service, they, mm -hmm. they tend to call it on that, on that coast. 
And a lot of them had abolished it about a decade before and were deciding to put it back together again. And so I had a, what I consider a unique opportunity to go to Loma Linda and help them rebuild HAS. It literally did not wow. exist and rebuild it from scratch. Uh, that, was, that was stressful. Um, and, uh, you know, that was my second year of ECF. That's how I ended up in Los Angeles. So I did my detail as an assistant director at the VA Greater Los Angeles Healthcare System. Which is a massive It is system. massive. massive. Uh, which is, what, this is the other unique thing about VA. I'll yeah. tell you, I don't know a single job announcement you can look at where the 1A facility no, doesn't, doesn't <laughs> say they're the largest and most complex facility in VA, right? That's, LA said the same thing. That's for sure. But it was interesting because I remember going there. And it is large, but they didn't have near the number of uniques mm -hmm. that you know Dallas or Houston yep. has. So large is you know kind of in the eye of the beholder. But uh, yeah, large campus, um, you know, multitude of facilities, and uh, I, I was their first assistant, permanent assistant director for a number of years. So you know the job kind of morphed uh, as I was in it. And um, you know if there's one lesson I learned in uh, a large place like LA it was that you can't judge a book by its cover, right? They, they'd had a lot of challenges there, consistent turnover in leadership. But I'll tell you, I was more impressed with the caliber of some of their clinical staff yeah. and oh, researchers yeah. than at any other facility I've worked at to date. And um, anyway, so you know, I worked in LA for a number of years, loved the experience there. Um, you, know, you know, I think every facility you get to learn, when you move around, you get a chance to learn um, what to do. You also get a chance to learn what not to do. Yep. Always. Uh, and so um, great, great tour through Los Angeles. Uh, applied to be the associate director in Houston. Um, you know, went to Houston. That's where my wife was born and raised, so she was happy uh, <laughs> that, that we could go, go to Houston. And, um, you know, after being in Houston almost three years, um, you know, got a, got a call expressing you know, interest in me applying for my first directorship in, in Central Texas. And um, went there and uh, um, inside scoop, I, I actually, I'm excited to be in San Antonio, but it's, again, one of these rare opportunities. I didn't apply for the job. Mm -hmm. I, I was reassigned there uh, and went to Central Texas after being there about two, two and a half years. Uh, my wife and kids actually stayed back in, in Houston for a school district, so I was commuting uh, for two years. I was, you know, in, in uh, Temple, Texas during the week, drive back to Houston on the weekends, and uh, after about two years, said, I am, um, you know, I'm getting yeah, kind of tired yeah. of my, my my baby girl started asking me, you know, when, Daddy, when are you coming home, yeah. like, to stay? And, um, uh, you know, had some discussions and learned of the vacancy in, in San Antonio. And um, so another unique tidbit that you asked me about, my, my kids are bilingual, so um, uh, neither of my wife or I are, are Hispanic, but um, really invested in a language education for mm -hmm. our kids. Uh, and so the, the dual language program that we were looking forward to putting them in in Temple just didn't shape up to what we were expecting. So that's why my wife took the kids back to Houston, uh, so they could continue that language uh, education. They're both now fluent uh, in, in Spanish that's at fantastic. eight and nine years old. Uh, but the distance was just getting difficult. And so that's what ultimately got us to San Antonio. And things are still going well. Yeah, going fantastic yeah. Uh, career that you've had and, and how it's touched on so many people and so many different lives. Mm -hmm. And you, you touched on, I think, a, a point that I, I guess wanted to explore a little bit more. As you mentioned, a large facility like, like a GLA, mm -hmm. um, if you're an aspiring leader mm -hmm. in there, you know, how do you kind of, let's say, get noticed? Hmm. If you're in such a large facility and you want to, you want to get into a, a medical center yeah. director, that's your career aspirations, how do you kind of get there? What kind of advice would you give to somebody yeah. that's looking for that kind of thing? I think many of us have, have heard that adage that, you know, iron sharpens iron, yep. right? And I, I think, um, the worst thing for anyone to do when they're aspiring to leadership is to look for the path of least resistance. It just doesn't make sense, right? You, you can't look for the easiest opportunity to progress to a position of status where you're going to be looked at for guidance and leadership, and mm -hmm. in many cases, to be able to talk people through scenarios that you yourself have had, right? You can't speak to all these things from the ivory tower. Uh, so what I would tell anyone is, don't shy away from a challenge, right? right. Um, you, you, you have to be the one that runs into the fire. At some point, hey, you can get to a cooler spot, but it doesn't make sense to try to avoid difficulty um, if you want to be a leader. It just, it's, it doesn't work. No. Yeah. It, comes, it comes around whether you want it to or not. Yeah, true. And you have to figure out and know have background in order to get to those yeah. things. And so you just kind of got to work your way well, up. It's true. But I think the other thing that, um, honestly, John, because I've seen it is um, you know, the lower you fail, the smaller the splash, right? <laughs> That's right? And so if you, you can fail, and I encourage you to, in those lower level positions, yeah. because, you know, when you hit the ground, 
you know, it's not uh, um, a career-ending event. But if you wait uh, until you're in uh, assistant, associate, or a medical center directorship, chief of staff role, to have those first critical failures, yeah. you may not be able to recover from it. So make those mistakes early. Um, so that you don't have to make them for the first time when you're a medical center director. Yeah, you're speaking about failure, and, and you talked about HRO, and mm -hmm. you, you're one of the flagship sites mm -hmm. for our HRO journey. Um, that, that's where the great thing uh, about HRO is the culture shift to that, where failure and lessons learned are, are key components, yeah. and and uh, we're looking for systems that are not working, not not people that are not working. Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe we'll talk a little bit about sure. how things have gone for you in HRO. Yeah. Oh, man, it's... Um I mean, I know I keep speaking about it like it's the gospel. Now, I know there's only one gospel, <laughs> but I'll tell you, it's a close second. And, and the reason I say that is, it's, it, I mean, it really is culture changing. Um, if you, right, if you follow the text, right, if you, if you, if, if there's one critical lesson I'd give, I would encourage uh, any leader to take to heart, is sometimes, you know, you, you can get initiatives and it's easy to delegate them and say, oh, hey, you know, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Associate Director or, you know, Mrs. Chief of Staff, I want you to take this HRO thing and, you know, go do that. Yeah. It doesn't work. Uh, you really have to understand it. You've got to be able to speak to it. You really have to be the face of it. Yeah. Um, because many of those cultural implications of high reliability, like not resulting to blame in a just culture, you have to be able to emulate, right? So if I say we're not going to jump to blame, I can't be the one on the board meeting saying, hey, this is your fault. Right. Why'd you let this happen? Right. So you've got to embody those behaviors on, on a very a very personal level. Um, and so for us, what I've seen is uh, the more I message it, right, the more I round, the more I engage with staff, uh, the more I provide that constant messaging and feedback. Yeah. Um, and obviously expect the same of my leaders, but yeah, to some degree, I feel like if they see me practicing those behaviors, yeah whether it's intentional or, or non-intentional, you start to see those things change. Uh, those same behaviors, you know, emulated in the, the other levels of, uh, of leadership. But I think for us, the major tangible benefits that I've seen so far are definitely increases in incident reports, right? We talk a lot about, um, you know, encouraging folks to report and you know, how the JPSR system works and that we're not gonna result to blame. This is your opportunity to drive change and that you will hear from us if you report something. Um, so I've messaged that. I put in a number of JPSRs myself. If someone reports something to me, I'll load it in as a JPSR. Uh, and so in the, in the first year, we saw a 20% increase right. in reporting. I mean, right. it was substantial. Uh, but, you know, when you break that down and you say, well, okay, 20% is great, but if I already had, you know, nurses doing 90% of the reporting, do I just have more nurses reporting? And it actually wasn't true. Well, we saw, you know, significant increases in physician reporting, significant increases in pharmacy reporting, uh, and significant increases in, like, therapist rehab, um, you know, physical therapy, those sorts of folks, uh, and, uh, and administrative, especially with the community care advent, right? And so that for me was like, okay, right, we're getting more people engaged. But then to see that perceived engagement translate to all employer survey. Right. right? So when, oh, we, wow. when we got the AES results back, you know, the engagement scores went up, the best place to work score, I think, jumped four percentage points. Um, so, you know, good indicators that the staff are, are definitely more engaged. Uh, and then for us, it was also focusing on not just people telling me they feel more engaged, that's great, right? All employer survey employees you know, showing me on, on, in a survey they feel more engaged, that's great too. But this is about harm, right? And so when we actually look at harm events, whether it's through patient safety indicators, through um, uh, sentinel events, actually seeing positive trends in that direction as well to say, hey, I don't want for us high reliability just to be about the way people feel, that's great. Right. But we also need to make sure we're staying focused on those actual harm events, which is what high reliability is all about. Right. So we're seeing all the indicators uh, moving in the right direction. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You know, cause zero harm Absolutely. is the key. And I think walking the walk and talking the talk and, and being out there, leading from the front, Absolutely. really is what you're doing in yeah. order to, to get buy-in for HRO. Yeah. But it's a culture change. And, and you mentioned all employee survey scores just through the roof. I mean, we have just done a magnificent job in the last two years of continuing an yeah. upward trajectory. Um, and there's still work to be done, still lots of work to be done. And you know, diversity and inclusion is one that we're really yeah. focusing a lot of energy on and we will continue to focus energy on uh, this year. 
uh, sexual assault and sexual harassment mm -hmm. prevention and, and ending those things are, are other things that we're uh, focusing a lot of energy on this year. And you had sat on the uh, integrated uh, performance team for the uh, diversity and inclusion office. Can you tell us a little bit how that came to be? Because I am very excited because, <laughs> you know, that's just going to be down the hall yeah. for me and um, excited for what that's going to do. But maybe you know, a broad stroke of kind sure. of what, what you see in that. Well, it was, it was, um, I was like the, like uh, in my particular case, I was working with women's health and I think I was the only male. Uh, on the group, but I volunteered uh, to, to sit in that seat, and it was a bit personal to me because my, I told you my mo mother's an Army veteran, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I also know as I look at our healthcare system's demographics, not just at the national level, but definitely in the state of Texas and in San Antonio specifically, significant increases in women veterans representation right. of our total veteran population. So to me, it only made sense to say, look, if we're going to be leading the demographic shift, you know, I need to be well tuned in to you know, what our female veterans are saying about, about our healthcare system. And then on, you know, on a more you know, distant note, you know, my, my little girl is, is uh, definitely um, a, a, a bit off the old block and I could easily uh, see her you know, at one point joining our armed forces. Mm -hmm. She's just got that disposition. Um, so I said, you know, if I can create um, you know, a better culture in VA, you know, should she decide to go that route uh, and at some point you know, be a patient that's cared for in our healthcare system, you know, what, what, what better thing to do? Um, so it was um, it was really eye opening. You know, we talked a lot about the culture uh, of the healthcare system, and um, I actually had an opportunity to interview uh, some women veterans. Um, some were employee veterans, some were um, you know not employee veterans from across the country. Some that had actually come to my healthcare system mm -hmm. in San Antonio, to um, you know, others on the, the East Coast, and then the, in the South, and just hear some really heartfelt stories uh, about what they experienced. Um, from other veterans when they walked in the facility, whether it was sitting in a waiting area or in some cases, um, you know, engaging with a receptionist at a, at a check-in desk um, and um, just little things that we could pay more attention to, like not always assuming that if a female is in our buildings that they're there for their veteran husband, right? right? And, right. Um, you know, just pausing for a second, being mindful that, hey, our demographics are shifting just ask them if you can help them, right? Yeah. You don't have to immediately assume that they're in some other role. Um, to, uh, in some cases, just taking a more absolute stance that, hey, if something happens uh, in a facility that makes one of our women veterans feel harassed, uh, that we have a clear mechanism yeah. for them to report those things. We have every duty to review it and investigate it if need be and make clear to anyone that was involved, whether it was an employee or another veteran, that that behavior just won't be uh, acceptable. So we talked about culture. Other thing we talked about was... Um, access and some of the, the data was just surprising that you really wouldn't know uh, unless you looked at it. But that in some cases, whether it was a primary care, some of our specialty services, that women veteran access was variant, right? In some cases, it would take longer for a female veteran to see a cardiologist. Why that was, we yeah. never quite figured out, but you could see longer wait times no matter what region we were looking at. Um, to, uh, in some cases, you know, primary care, uh, where you know, wait times for women veterans would, would be longer. Uh, so it just gave us an opportunity to, again, take a step back, look at the data, yeah. and see if we could make some recommendations and maybe target some uh, particular visions where you know, some um, more significant opportunities for improvement existed. And ultimately, just you know, trying to continue this, mess, this journey, lay the foundation as this uh, demographic continues to shift. Because they're growing at twice the rate yeah. of our male veterans. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's amazing. And uh, it's indicative of what's going on in our armed forces, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but also, what that really shows is what happens when we're in a system, yeah. a healthcare system across the country, is that where there's lessons learned from each spot yeah. and, and understanding the wait times that nobody else may have seen. Yeah increasing and then being able to do some kind of response back to it so that's fantastic well chris we've come to the end of our time and i just am so thankful to get the viewers to learn more about you and and uh your your uh, fantastic career and how you care for veterans and uh anything you want to close with um you know john i'll just say look it's been a great opportunity to, to come up and chat with you you know i've i've just had a great ride uh, with the va what's what's really kept me with this agency um, not that I haven't had stressful moments where I say, why am I doing this? <laughs> but I'll tell you, what keeps you here is just the, just the amazing caliber of the people you amazing. work with, yep. right? Honestly, it's, um, 
family is what brought me here. I told you about my, my mother and father, but it's the VA family that's kept me here uh, just because of the relationships you get to build. When you work for the largest healthcare system in the country, there's a lot of geographic opportunity, yeah. uh, but that also creates opportunities to just make great connections. Yeah, cool. Chris, thank you again. I can't thank you enough for taking the time to be with us. And I hope everybody learned something about you and the career as well as, as VA and what's, what's going on. And anyway, thank you so much. My Appreciate pleasure. It. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. See you next time. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. A huge thank you to all of you for listening, and thank you to Chris for his time. See you in the next episode.